Clerk will call the roll. Lynn Whitley, County Judge. Here. Roy Charles Brooks, Commissioner of Precinct 1. Present. Andy H. Wynn, Commissioner of Precinct 2. Here. Gary Fickus, Commissioner of Precinct 3. J.D. Johnson, Commissioner of Precinct 4. Here. Constitutes a quorum. Thank you. Our invocation today will be delivered by Bishop Eric McClellan from the Mercy Seat Church in North Western Hills. Thank you very much for coming out today. After the invocation, please remain standing for our moment. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for who you are and the mercy that you've given to each and every one of us. We thank you for all of the business that will be discussed today. We ask you, God, for your grace and your mercy and your wisdom upon all of these things that will be discussed and decisions that will be made. Bless the judge and all of the commissioners in the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you. <coughs> Agenda announcements, Mr. Magnus. Thank you, Your Honor. Members of the Court, we have three announcements related to the agenda <coughs> this morning. The, um, the first one is under proclamations, resolutions, and presentations. It'll be 6A. This is a proclamation for DMLA day, or month. We're going to hold that for one week. Next one is under the administrator section, item 8A1. This is the policy statement that we discussed briefly last week. We're not going to take any action today, but we are going to have a discussion as it relates to, uh, to what's going on at the legislature as it relates to truancy. And then finally, members of court, under information technology, item 8G2, this is the SAP contract for licenses. Uh, there's a revised court communication in your, in your backup material. What uh, is included in there is, is part of an addendum to that agreement. Also, a uh, letter indicating it is a sole source. So there's nothing that changes on the court communication itself or the agreement in general. It's just some additional documents that uh, we fail to attach to the electronic court book. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Court members, you have before you the minutes of our regular meeting of March the 10th. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, we have ratification of a proclamation on Poison Prevention Week, and I move its approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. You have before you the consent agenda. Move for the approval of the consent agenda. Second. We have a motion to second to approve the consent agenda. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Mr. Manius. Thank you, Your Honor. Members of court, our first item was an issue that was brought up last week, and it dealt with try attempting to develop a legislative policy statement in support of truancy issues, uh, truancy reduction issues, excuse me. When the legislature initially began to file uh, different pieces of proposed legislation as related to truancy, uh, there were a large number of those bills filed. At that time, it appeared that uh, the legislature was going in a particular direction. One would, would deal with 17-year-olds. One would deal with decriminalization. One would be to, to try to help um, manage that process through the court system, yet at the same time not create a criminal record. Uh, the Council of Urban uh, Counties uh, had a, a a teleconference where we had a large grouping of, uh, of urban county representatives from across the state that talked about these particular issues. I think that uh, Judge Whitley, you and Commissioner Fickus received some of the paperwork at the last CUC meeting on Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday afternoon there were some hearings and as far as the batch of juvenile bills that and, and truancy bills that were that had initially been introduced. The problem is, is that it is a very fluid situation now. Those bills have been 
or the thought process behind those bills have changed somewhat. And so in order to take some type of a, an affirmative position now may be somewhat premature. We may, what we may need to do is just simply monitor those bills, be prepared to come into the courtroom here on any Tuesday and, and get a legislative uh, policy statement for how our, we want to approach those issues. Unfortunately, if we do that today, we may have to come back and, and modify that. So I know that Commissioner Wynn, you were the first, you were the individual on the court initially that brought the truancy issue up uh, last Tuesday. And if you have any comments or any court member has any comments and direction <coughs> to staff, we would appreciate it. Well, thank you, GK. Court members, uh, I contacted GK uh, yesterday expressing some concern about the position that we are uh, going to take today. And the reason for my concern uh, is because um, things are going very uh, quite fluid right now at the state level. And also within all county, uh, we have uh, our JP uh, courts. We have uh, 21 different school districts. And then we have uh, multiple stakeholders, including our own juvenile. Uh, we have not had a chance to sit down and through some sort of a meeting format, to discuss what is the best way to approach truancy. What I have found is uh, we receive phone call from several uh, stakeholders, if you will, uh, basically expressing concern uh, about our position. Uh, Mansfield ISD, the superintendent, also had some concern about uh, the un unfunded mandate and uh, it will cost. Uh, the school district more money because they would have to hire staff and so forth and then it would have to uh, essentially um, lose some of the local control <coughs> as far as how to deal with truancy at the local level so apparently right now at the local level even at within town county we don't have a whole lot of uh, uh, agreement in how to best approach um, uh, the management and the prevention of truancy yet uh, we all have our own set of ideas, but somehow I think we need to put our heads together to come up with a recommended best of practice, and we can implement that like, uh, for example, Fort Bend County uh, has done that. They basically uh, came together as a county, and they came up with a, a best practice uh, within that county on a volunteer basis without uh, legislation imposed from, uh, from the state. Uh, Last week, we met, and perhaps I did not communicate clearly to Mr. Manius and his team. Uh, I was merely suggesting that we pay attention to the various proposed legislation involving truancy, understand it, and inform the stakeholders, <coughs> inform the courts, inform the, the JPs, uh, so that we can uh, react uh, in an informed uh, way. Uh, but uh, so that that is the reason why I I, uh, I would like for us to delay or remove this item from our agenda and have a further discussion about it. Uh, the there are multiple pieces of legislation proposed in Austin right now, and I think uh, we need to rely on Mr. Mendes and Mr. Uh, Turner to fully understand uh, the ramifications of those uh, conditions that uh, are being proposed in Austin. I'd like to take a little bit different approach. Yes, sir. And that being that unless this court has passed a resolution, then it does not rise to the level of a priority on Mr. Mendez's agenda. Uh, I am all for having a community conversation on this issue. But by the time we have that community conversation, we'll be waiting for the next legislative session, and we won't have accomplished anything. Uh, the thing that I heard you say this morning, that is a part of one of our several of the bills, is the whole issue of decriminalization. I think that is probably something that most people could agree upon. Uh, but at any rate, uh, Mr. Mendez has to have some firm direction from this court that this is an issue that we want him to watch 
that uh, we, we want to give him some authority to weigh in uh, in support of good bills and in uh, opposition to bad old bills. Yeah, I will say that this is something that the policy committee of the of Conference of Urban Counties is watching and, and monitoring as it goes forward. And we had uh, a fairly good discussion, mm -hmm. and I think there are mixed feelings at this point in time. I, you know, I'm kind of, without my notes, I'm trying to figure out exactly what we decided last time, but I think we're just kind of monitoring what's going on. Right. The, issue, the, issue, there also, so. yeah, the issue with the 17-year-olds didn't seem, in fact, that's been pulled down now. Uh, there was an issue of sending some of these to uh, a, a larger number of, of, of truants to the juvenile court, <coughs> which would overwhelm the juvenile court. There was discussion about, um, <coughs> about the issue of total decriminalization, and, and there was a feeling that while they wanted to decrease or degradate that impact of criminalization, that the court still needed to have some ability to enforce truancy laws. And, and so, as I said, this, and, and that carried over to that. I don't uh, disagree with the fact that they need to be able to control truancy laws. It's the criminalization of truancy right. that and, is a problem. And they're still me. struggling. They're, they're trying to get there, but they're still struggling as to how that's going to happen. Um, may I make a suggestion? Uh, would you take a look? This was our first first effort on this. Take a look at this policy and uh, give me your thoughts on it. I'll have Mr. Mendez to begin to monitor what what activities are going on. And if we can maybe tweak this or, or get it into a fashion that is acceptable to all five members of the court, then we will put this back up next Tuesday. And but I would ask that you look at this. Give me your comments. Some to me as, as soon as you can. We will turn around and send them back to you to see if it, it satisfies where we want to go. And if not, well, then we'll just have some other discussions. And as far as local school districts <laughs> and their revenue is concerned, they will certainly benefit from having more butts in the seats because their average per pupil per, per day payment uh, is tied to whether or not those kids come to school. Yeah. Well, the, the issue here is we cannot implement a truancy policy effectively without the proactive collaboration from the school district. That's the bottom line. And we cannot implement any truancy policy, truancy management policy, without uh, basically obtaining um, buy-in from all JPs. And I know that some of our JPs, including certain members of our law enforcement community, feel like uh, decriminalization may have some unintended consequences. So uh, I agree with what Commissioner Brooks is saying. We need to somehow, as a county, we need to make truancy a priority, in which I believe the management of truancy or the reduction of truancy will help improve high school graduation rate, which is very much in line with our strategic goals. What I'm hoping is for the, this court, this body, to pass a resolution supporting truancy as a priority, uh, but for us to explore and gain a thorough understanding about truancy first uh, before we form a policy and, and, uh, and, and deal with it. Uh, so uh, I agree with you, Commissioner. I just think for us to take a stand right now in a certain direction, it may be a little bit premature. The other thing that I would say is when we talk about criminalization, there's two focuses on that. Obviously, there is the one on the student, but there's also one on the parents that is correct. to encourage them to make sure that, uh, you know, the child is right. attending class. And that, you know, a big part of that issue was down in the uh, um, elementary school levels as well from, from that standpoint. So that, I, I, I agree that I don't think we're ready to 
take any action at this point in time. We just need to continue to monitor it. If you give me your comments, we'll try to fashion something uh, for next week. And uh, we'll also have Mr. Mendez, now that, that the Wednesday meetings are over with, the hearings, we can get a, we can maybe have a, a more clear understanding as to where the legislature might want to go on this. Okay. Are there any other questions? Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Glenn. Is she over there? Okay. <coughs> Move to receive and file the personnel agenda. Second. We have a motion to second to receive and file the personnel agenda. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. We have Good morning. Uh, four additional items. The second <clears throat> item, we're asking the court to approve a waiver of terminal benefits for the sheriff's uh, office. As explained in your court communique, there's a labor detail specialist who's retiring uh, or who retired at the end of January with 400 hours. So some of the hours have, of course, burned down. The sheriff's office is requesting a waiver of 120 of those hours. The uh, net cost to the general fund is less than $1,000. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. The motion passes unanimously. With our third item, we're asking the court to approve uh, organizational changes to both the sheriff's uh, office and the 372nd District Court. Judge Wish is requesting the transfer of two bailiffs uh, from the sheriff's office to his court. Uh, as the court is aware, the criminal district courts are able to appoint up to two bailiffs, and so Judge Wish is exercising his uh, discretion to do that. There is no fiscal impact. Uh, related to this transfer. Okay. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Our fourth item, we're asking the court to approve changes to the table of organization for criminal court administration. I think uh, Mr. Shugard has uh, provided the court some information with regard to this request, and I believe he is here this morning to answer any additional questions. But basically the request is to add an associate judicial staff counsel position. Um, uh, there's a belief that there is legal support, uh, additional legal support that's uh, needed in this case. There is one individual currently employed who provides that support. If the court approves this request, the impact to the general fund uh, on an annual basis will be approximately $130,000, including fringe benefits. Was not anticipated before the budget process this year? Uh, it's my understanding, Commissioner, that there are part-time funds available, so I think there was anticipation of some mm -hmm. assistance that's needed. Um, again, that's uh, just based upon the workload the request now is rather than part-time help, full-time help. For the sake of argument, I move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. So I guess the question was, was this discussed in the budget? As part-time. That's, part that's what they asked. Would you give it this year to see what the outcome was? And the options were, was it needed at all? Continue it with part-time or evaluate for I don't know if it was ever filled part-time or not. It was certainly made available. And would was this attorney serve just the criminal courts, or would he be serving the? The district and the, it's the, only the upgrades the here. Courts, the Come on up, Greg. I see Greg brought his judge. <laughs> brought his muscle with him. Well, I <laughs> Real the, muscle. The real, the real <laughs> muscle is still sitting in the back. Uh, yes, she is. She's, she's our savior. Um, th this position is to serve all 20 courts. We have, uh, we have five new judges and um, an addition, additional workload of writs. The, the judges you have five are, new judges, but not five new courts. That's correct. But as, uh, as the, you know, the new judges take a little bit more to bring online, this is recorded, isn't it? It is, and they're listening to you as you I'm speak. sure they are. <laughs> so, so that was that was the need, and uh, there were part-time funds available, and, and the judges determined that they didn't need a part-time person; they needed a full-time person. 
if I may interject. Commissioner Please. Fickus, Commissioner Fickus, you ask if they were civil or criminal. These are all, 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 all criminal. criminal. All criminal. No, all no. Right. I asked if they were. Well, um, okay. What I meant was are they state district courts and county courts? They are both. Uh, both. Okay. The, 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 the proposed position is to, to serve both county and district court judges. And the justification for that particular position, if I can add my personal opinion and thoughts, and I don't speak for the other judges, of course, is that Mr. Reynolds is answering writs that have to be responded to the Court of Criminal Appeals within 180 days. In addition to that, we have approximately 125 writs pending right now. So with the workload that's based upon that, in addition to it, we gave him additional responsibilities to act as a magistrate, to have hearings, to act in our stead. His workload has increased dramatically. Um, from a budgetary standpoint, we've tried to minimize those costs by using interns for years. But now we've reached a point where we have to have a paid position to answer those writs that must be done in a timely fashion. Otherwise, we jeopardize those convictions. Furthermore, we run afoul as judges with the Court of Criminal Appeals. In addition to that, when we're talking about a death penalty case, we need that expertise to help us draft those responses. I, in one case, recently had with the Court of Criminal Appeals and a deadline that was not extended, and they would not allow for it. And so we needed that additional help to complete the work that it was at hand to answer those issues that were raised in the writ of habeas corpus that will be reviewed by a federal judge and ultimately by the U.S. Supreme Court. So with that type of workload, we need the experience and we also need a, pe a person that is not just simply acting as a volunteer. Well, so, I, and I guess the only question I would have is, is that you had one. Yes. And we had agreed through the budget process to give you an opportunity to evaluate whether or not one and a half would be enough. Yes. And that was what I thought was agreed to during the budget process. But it sounds like y'all just decided that, well, no, the half isn't going to work, and therefore we're just not going to do it, and we're going to hire and ask for a full time. Well, as you, as you can appreciate, trying to reach a consensus. It comes to with muscle. <laughs> Ten. I can actually address that specifically. I know that um, to address writs of habeas corpus, it takes a certain level of expertise in an attorney. You have to review the whole trial record in light of whether there was competent legal representation. And you can't hire someone fresh out of law school or has a year or two of experience. I know Mr. Reynolds did approach a number of different people that he had in mind that he knew might consider a part-time position or be available for a part-time position who were at the level of experience that would be necessary. None of them were willing to consider part-time work for that kind of, for that level of legal representation. So I know that he, he talked to probably five or six <coughs> different attorneys and, out, and talked to them informally about would you consider a part-time position? I'd like for you to look at this and all of them declined. And at that point we thought this is gonna have to be a full-time position because of the level of work that Reuben has outlined. Could he not have done the, the more extensive level of experience needed and allowed the temporary person to do the less stuff? And is the magistration part of it, is, that's what, is that weighing so much on his time that he's not there actually doing what we originally intended for him to do? It's a mixture of all of the things that he does. He doesn't just do writs. He doesn't just do magistration. He also responds week by week, day by day, to different calls from the court about, I need you to come look at this charge issue. I'm hearing a suppression, and I need you to sit in. He went with Judge Stearns for a week when Judge Stearns conducted the court of inquiry that he conducted in Georgetown and sat with him for a week to offer him legal advice because it was kind of a, a new type of, of hearing that he was conducting. So he offers us all his legal expertise. He's also agreed recently because of demand to take on the county criminal courts and issues. He's not been their attorney formally. He's agreed to take on their work as well formally. And now with the 300 plus writs that he handles per year, plus offering us on the spot legal advice that he does every week, in addition to magistrations, it's simply more than one attorney can handle. And he can't find someone on a part-time basis to handle that kind of work as well. 
Perhaps it would have been better for this to have been fully discussed during the budget cycle, but I think we're at a point where we can't afford not to do this. And I, I don't disagree. I just, I mean, I we keep adding responsibilities. I mean, the magistration, who else could do the magistration? Magist we have other magistrates, right? We have other magistrates. They're they're also busy. They could potentially do magistration <coughs> in writ cases, but Mr. Reynolds has appellate expertise that allows him to be the best suited person for this. That's the reason why we hired him is because he came from, he had public defender, uh, appellate public defender and appellate private practice expertise that allowed him to step into the position and fully handle it. Pretty sensitive about changing the budget in the middle of the year. I understand it. We, we, we wanted to do it on a part-time basis. As Ruben said, we've been handling this through unpaid interns. Unfortunately, unpaid <coughs> law school interns, it's hard to train them to the point where they can help because then they leave. <coughs> and, you know, they are unpaid. And so we don't have a strong hold. <laughs> exactly. And that training so, itself takes away from It, it does. He has, to, he has to handle a writ school every single summer where he trains the interns for a week on what to do. <coughs> and that's a week lost for his other, his other responsibilities. Recently, the, the law has changed in the last couple of years, and the deadlines for writs has shortened and tightened, as Ruben has referenced, so we don't any longer have unlimited amounts of time or long expanses of time to handle writs. They have to be handled in a certain fashion on a certain deadline. So that's pressed us a little bit. And furthermore, the judges themselves are also pressed, because when we originally started the 432nd in 2009, the workload of each of us roughly was about 120 to 125 cases. Now we're looking at approximately 160 to 175 cases apiece. So our time is now dwindled that we also had more time to deal with those cases and now we're relying more on Charles and these judicial staff councils to help us meet those obligations as well. Our population is growing. It's becoming more sophisticated. In addition to it, the courts are becoming more demanding and wanting us to be more responsive to them. So having this position is crucial for us to be efficient in answering those deadlines in a timely fashion. Any other questions? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you judges. And the last item for the court is item number five. We're asking the court to approve amendment number 12 to the senior supplement plan group health insurance policy and amendment number nine to the Medicare Advantage health plan terms and conditions agreement between United Health Care <coughs> slash Pacific Care and Tarrant County. It's a mouthful. These are just the agreements and the, in this case amendments that we bring to the court every year. The only thing that these amendments do is they outline rates uh, for our senior plans for 2015. And just as a reminder, there were no uh, changes, uh, plan changes in 2015. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. This says that the financial impact for 2015 is 3.4 million. I'm assuming that's budgeted? Yes, sir. Is that not a com both a combination of county and uh, retiree? Uh, is that total? It's both. Well, the, the key thing is I just wanted it's to make both. sure it was in the budget and yes. this wasn't something we were... No, it's, it's included in the budget. That we had oops someplace. No, no oops. No oops. No oops. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Chris. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, members of the court, we have uh, one item for your consideration this morning. It is uh, requested that uh, the Commissioner's Court approve uh, issuance of a purchase order uh, for a requisition uh, 10019849 in the amount of uh, $1,989.92 uh, to Able Communications uh, uh, Incorporated. Move for approval. Second. Second. We have a motion to second. Um, has this work already been completed? Yes, sir. 
Did we not? Do, what did we purchase? We purchased some cabling. Yes, uh, we purchased uh, some uh, some cabling components uh, to uh, complete uh, uh, the cabling work. Uh, that this um, a contract that we have and. Um, when we had evaluated it, uh, there was a few components there that uh, were audio-visual components that were not noticed, and that's uh, why uh, we had to while come to court. It, yes, while sir. we're issuing a purchase order for something we've already Im implemented? Yes, sir. What happened, Your Honor? We thought that, uh, that these components were on one of our uh, bids already, and uh, we found out that it wasn't. This is just uh, a minor administrative cleanup of that issue. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Mr. Beecham. <clears throat> no. Oh, we came closer, you, we came closer to beating speech, Kentucky so. than you did. <laughs> you can just stop. You're not coming forward. You, need, you don't get to say anything. Sit down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm not going to go there. It's not. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we, have, uh, we have four items for your consideration this morning. The first one is bid number 2015-058. This is the annual contract for custom file folders for the district clerk's office. We're recommending the award to Staples Commercial Printing per unit price. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second <coughs> discussion. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Our second item is bid number 2015 069. This is the rental of modular office uh, building for the uh, Precinct 1 administration uh, for facilities management. We're recommending the award to Box mo Modular in the amount of $52,050. Uh, if approved, we're also asking for uh, approval of the contract, acceptance of the payment, and performance bonds. I move approval and would state that this is in order to facilitate the uh, reconstruction of our maintenance facility. We've got to move out of the old building into something so they can tear it down and rebuild. I'll second. Got a motion to second. Welcome to the double wides. Yeah. And <laughs> Does it have that addition of building? Hopefully. Delivery schedule for tomorrow. That's With air condition. I don't know about that. Oh, it'll have air conditioning. Yeah. Motion passes unanimously. Our third item is uh, RFP number 2015-037. Uh, this is an RFP for credit card uh, processing for the public health department. We're rejecting, uh, we're asking for uh, permission to reject all bids. Uh, we're not prepared at this time to go out for or put together revised specifications or ask for permission. Uh, there is some concern regarding the the bidders that did the the two bidders that did submit uh, proposals. Uh, I'm sorry, the five bidders that submitted proposals. Neither none of them were able to hold the the fee structure as we had requested uh, in the RFP. So we're in the process of of looking at this uh, and determining uh, what our next action might be. We're working with the health department. Health department is also looking at the county clerk's office contract. Uh, to see how they're structured and see if we can do something similar to that. So we'll come back to you at a later date uh, for permission to, uh, to put this back out on the street. We also have additional contracts <coughs> of this type in other departments. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. We're looking at all possibilities right now. Uh, the health department has not taken credit card uh, charges since uh, uh, January, I believe. So... Uh, uh, we're not uh, we're not doing anything in that area for the health department, well, but we but we did plan on putting something together. Let's not let this linger too long. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do I have a motion? Move approval. Second. We have a motion. A second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Our last item is RFP number 2015-066. This is our annual contract for the ground-based mosquito control. Uh, spraying activities uh, for the health department. Uh, we're also requesting rejection of the uh, all proposals that were received, and we are requesting permission to uh, revise these specifications and put them back out on the street again. Uh, what we what we ran into was the uh, 
uh, we had requested that the unit of measure for the backpack and the ATV uh, sprain, which was going to be new on this contract, uh, we were requesting this be priced per acre, and as it turned out, uh, there is a, a, a much smaller unit of measure, such as the, the, uh, uh, the trap areas, the, the ponds, the pools, uh, culverts, things like that. Uh, in talking to the bidders, they all agreed that this would be a, a better way to put this together so that we can actually compare apples to apples. So that's, that's what we're in the process of doing right now. How quickly can you turn that around? Uh, this bid expires in May, and we can have this done before May. Now, we do spend uh, less than $50,000 on this, so we, uh, we do intend to have it done before then, but uh, uh, just in case we bump up against that, we'll still be in good shape on that. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Riley. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We have three items for you this morning. Uh, the first one is we are requesting approval of an escrow agreement for holding of deed pending <coughs> consideration of an application to abandon and vacate certain public roads in connection with proposed Hinkin Ranch Estates. This is in Precinct 1. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. The second item is uh, we are requesting approval of an order to vacate and abandon a portion of Ben Dave Murren Road and all of Hinkin Road and Hinkin Court for the previously mentioned uh, plat approval. Uh, this is in Precinct 1. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. The third item I have is uh, we're requesting a approval of a letter denying the conveyance of a sanitary control easement to Aquas, Texas, Inc. This is in the city of Blue Mound in Precinct 4. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any appointments today? Being none, then you have before you the claims, including the addendum. Move approval of the claims, including the addendum. Second. We have a motion of second to approve the claims, including the addendum. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Briefing items, Mr. Manius. Thank you, Honor. Uh, members of the court, we have one item. That is item A, which is the legislative update uh, Mr. Mendez has included in your backup material his uh, weekly memorandum, plus we have the federal update that's immediately behind that. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out as far as the state update is that we are now past the 60 days and the bill filing uh, deadline has passed. We had over 1,500 bills that were filed in the last week alone. Uh, I don't know exactly how many bills. Total is over 6,900 bills. 6,900 total. It's a we record. So we have our work cut out for us. <coughs> Besides that, uh, if there's anything that you, if I might be able to answer in there, I'll be more than happy to try. I see Mr. Pipes is back there. He might have. Yeah. Do you have anything uh, to add or anything you'd like to? Uh... Sure. I wouldn't want to mess with the state side either if I were you. The big item in Washington right now is, of course, transportation. Um, the Highway Trust Fund, as we've noted before, uh, is up in May. There was a hearing two weeks ago, I think, I put in your in your memo. Um, so they are beginning to make work on that. Um, the Republicans released their budget this morning. Um, just a starting point for the negotiations. I'll send around a summary of that later today. Um, but we're very engaged in monitoring the situation and hope that uh, not only can we get a short-term extension of the Highway Trust Fund, but a long-term one as well. I would also mention uh, we continue to work on uh, a number of items uh, for the commissioners. We had uh, Commissioner Fickus and Judge Whitley up a couple weeks ago. We have Commissioner Brooks coming <coughs> in two weeks, I believe. Uh, so we'll be, we'll be very active in that. And then in April, uh, with Mr. Manius's help, we'll come back and do a full report on all of our legislative items and where we are and what the next steps are. But look for an email from me later today on the budget. That's the big. That's the big item today. Casey, yes, sir. With you, a moment when we get you bet. This. Happy to. Thank you. Any other questions? 
What, what's up with Mr. Wilder's uh, passport office? I think that's what we're going to talk about. process <laughs> of progress. Hopefully. <coughs> Don't get him stirred up. Don't even ask. <laughs> Thank you. You bet. Thank uh, you. I might also mention as he's up here, or as he was up here, that uh, y'all will recall that a couple of years ago we commissioned the USS Fort Worth. Uh, we are in the process of, you know, kind of reinvigorating the uh, one of the support arms of that, and that is the Anchor Club. And uh, I want to. I've talked with Commissioner Fickus and Commissioner Brooks, Commissioner Wynn, and Commissioner Johnson. I'll be talking with y'all after this is over with. But Mr. Manius and uh, Mr. Beecham and, and uh, Sharon Wilson and several others have uh, agreed to help support that, and so I'm going to – I'll be talking to you in a little bit. And Mr. Pipes has agreed to also help with that. So uh, it's a great event. It's a great cause. Uh, we have three crews that are actually uh, rotate in and out. <coughs> We've got a uh, – a, breakfast with the commander of the Juggernauts crew uh, that's going to come on the 31st at Colonial, which is a Tuesday morning, but we don't have court that day. And everybody who's a member of the Anchors Club gets that free, so I'll, that's what I'm going to talk to you about is joining the Anchors Club. There's, no free. The Anchors Club. There's nothing free, <laughs> Judge, if you're offering it to them. <laughs> and it but, ain't cheap either. But no. they've, you know, they're, uh, they've, he'll talk about the last year's operations they were part of the recovery uh, for the air asia aircraft that went down as well as other things they are now currently they're uh, in uh, the south in around in and around south korea so uh, he'll talk a little bit about that too so again thank you mr pipes for your support on that next mr manius that's all we have at this time y'all then we will recess our open meeting and proceed to close to discuss items exempted under sections 551.071, 072, 074, 076, and 087 of the Texas government. Hey, Tom. Redmond. Redmond.